Whether you have sleep issues, memory problems, stress, or pain, I have a company you've got to check out. I recently discovered a company called Tenacity. They're a full spectrum CBD company and their products are incredible. A few weeks ago, I had a hip flexor issue that was creating terrible pain down my leg and in my hip. And my gosh, I was in incredible pain. So I reached for their CBD and CBDA lotion. And in a few days, the pain was just about all gone. I've used other CBD products in the past, but this company stands out and here's why. They discovered that the combination of two of the hemp plant's compounds, CBD and CBDA, in a one-on-one ratio, were twice as effective as CBD alone and better than over-the-counter ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and aspirin. Kind of amazing. Tenacity has a full range of product lines like lotions, salves, soft gels, and tinctures. Something for everybody. So check them out. Head over to tenacity.com and use code ADULT and get 50% off at checkout. That's T-A-N-A-S-I.com and get 50% off your first order with promo code ADULT. The best part is try Tenacity products for 30 days. And if you don't love them, they'll give you a full refund. You've got nothing to lose. Are you ready for a transformation? If you're thinking, yes, I'd like to get unstuck. I'd like to transform. I want to move forward in my life. I want to live more from my true self. Then I hope you're joining me in Nashville in three weeks, November 3rd, 4th, and 5th for the Adult Chair Live Workshop. I hope you're joining me. If there's one thing that people say on their way out the door on day three is, I feel transformed. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> we have a lot of fun, but we do a lot of work over the course of those three days. I'd love to have you come join me live. For more information, head on over to theadultchair.com forward slash Nashville. Hi, I'm Michelle Shelfont, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life's challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. I am Michelle Shelfont. Happy to be here with you today in this middle of October. We have a fabulous guest today, a guest that has been on before that you have wanted to come back, and I did too, so we invite her to come back. It is the one and only Darlene Lancer. Yes, we talked about some incredible things on the show. We talked all about dating, loving, and leaving a narcissist, which, by the way, is the title of her new book. So we got into details with her new book. We talked about things that so many of you have written in about. So I made sure that I brought up all of your questions. And I want to say this, even if you are listening and you think, well, that's not me. I don't need the show today. You might be surprised. Either you or someone you know might be in a relationship that is abusive and we don't know it. This this was surprising for me. Having had a private practice for 25 years as a therapist and a coach, I was shocked over the number of people that came in and really just did not know that. And now again, I'm not saying they might not have been in a narcissistic relationship, but it was abusive. It was verbally or emotionally abusive. And we took, we and we, I say we as women, Unfortunately, mostly it is women, but not always. Sometimes we have men, but we sometimes take it, especially if we have codependency, we get caught in that net and we don't know that how we're being treated. It's just not okay. 
So this is why I love having Darlene on. She talks about something that is one of my favorite subjects, which of course is codependency, but she is just an expert in this field. So today we went through what is an abusive relationship and why abusive relationships are so hard to leave. We also talked about the five different kinds of abuse and subtle forms of abuse, like undermining or or negating you, interrupting you, speaking for you. I mean, withholding, denying reality, all the things. So much information here that you're going to really enjoy hearing. We talked about many surprising examples of abuse and talked about whether or not a healthy person can fall for a narcissist or fall for someone or get serious with someone that they are in an abusive relationship with. Like, how does that happen? Why does that happen? What's trauma bonding? We went into that so much, you guys. (laughs) Let me just tell you, the podcast is jam-packed today. You're going to want to hear it. And if you relate, I am going to absolutely be so happy that this helps you to transform something within you. But also, Don't forget to share the show to someone that you think that might need to hear this message today. I can't tell you how many messages that we get on these topics. So please, please, please share the show with someone that you feel might benefit from this today. So in case you don't know the one and only Darlene Lancer, let me tell you a little bit more about her. She's an international relationship expert and media spokesperson on narcissism and codependency. She's a psychotherapist and author of 10 books, including Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist, and Essential Tools for Improving or Leaving Narcissistic or Abusive Relationships, Conquering Shame and Codependency, Eight Steps to Freeing the True You and Codependency for Dummies. She's counseled individuals and couples for 30 years and coaches internationally. Her eBooks include 10 Steps to Self-Esteem, How to Speak Your Mind, Become Assertive and Set Limits, Dealing with a Narcissist, Eight Steps to Raise Self-Esteem and Set Boundaries with Difficult People, I Am Not Perfect, I Am Only Human, How to Beat Perfectionism and Freedom from Guilt and Blame finding self-forgiveness. They're available on Amazon and other online booksellers. And of course, at her website, which is whatiscodependency.com, where they can get a free copy of 14 tips for letting go. So I'm going to jump right into our conversation with Darlene Lancer. Here we go. So welcome back to the Adult Chair Podcast, Darlene Lancer. Thank you so much for inviting me back. It's a pleasure to talk to your audience. I know. It's so fun to have you here. Um, You have a new book. I do. I do. Yeah. Dealing with uh, abusive relationships. It's called Dating, Loving, and Leaving a Narcissist, Essential Tools for Improving or Leaving Narcissistic and Abusive Relationships. So there's a lot of literature out there just bashes narcissists, but most people that contact me don't want to leave. They want to make the relationship better. So a lot of it has to do on things that the partner or the child or the parent or the friend can do yeah. uh, to, to understand who you're dealing with and adapt yourself to what works better in the relationship. And then if that doesn't work, you're more prepared to leave if necessary. You know, and this is the the question that I even get, you know, I've been a therapist for 25 years, a coach for 10 years. I've seen clients for all those years. I get that the question is, can a narcissist change? What do you say to that? Important question. Well, there's a lot, uh, there's a myth out there and there's a lot of uh, blogs and articles about how they can't change and you just have to get out. But the good news is they can. Mm-hmm. If they're motivated, and you can help them be motivated to go to counseling and st- start to change their behavior. Now, if they have real deficits in empathy and intimacy issues, that might not be uh, something that's going to be remarkably different, but you can train them, teach them how to be less argumentative to be more cooperative, 
and to not be abusive. And that, that's definitely something you can work on their behavior. So a yeah. lot of it is behavioral modification and at a deeper level, uh, psychoanalytic therapy, if someone's really motivated to do that could be helpful, but that's a lengthier process. And actually statistics show that uh, over 17% of patients in therapy are narcissists. And How many percent? 17%. Oh, I think you said 70. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> 17. The other 80% are codependent. <laughs> <laughs> That's so um, true, right? Either codependent it takes someone skilled. really skilled. Yeah. To work with a narcissist and trained. Yeah. Um, yeah that's you, that's true. They're going to do to the, the therapist what they do to you in, in your relationship. There has to be someone strong and that understands and doesn't react and doesn't get into power struggles with them. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, you and I have talked about this before and I, and I really believe this too. I, when I think of narcissism, people have asked me that question and I always answer the same way as you, it sounds like, which is, it depends on where you are on the scale. There's a, a I see a scale of zero to five. And if you are, and I'm going to use, let's, let's call it the consciousness scale of narcissism. So if you are a five unconscious, unwilling to change, thinking it's absolutely not your fault at all, have zero empathy. I don't have any hope for that person that is a narcissist. However, if you're less on the scale, then I would say that there's, there's always hope, of course, but the abuse, it's just unconscious. Would you agree with that? How, what do you say about well, that? Actually, like all mental illness exists on a, on a continuum. Yeah. I can say in my book, Codependency for Dummies, codependency exists on yeah. a continuum too. Some people can even identify their emotions. Some mm -hmm. people have worse trauma uh, and they're less introspective. And then other people uh, have their, their codependency is mild and they can identify and communicate their feelings. So all mental illness is like that. And, and for narcissism, there's only five uh, traits that are required to make the diagnosis of NPD out of nine. Mm -hmm. So you can see that some individuals would have all nine severe. Yeah. And then other people will have just five, the minimum necessary, and they're mild. And it's interestingly, aggression is not one of the necessary traits. So not all narcissists are cr so cruel and aggressive. Some are just more withdrawn and cold. You know, so there's different types of narcissists. But if you do, if you learn what you're dealing with and learn to communicate in an effective way, because a lot of the way people interact with a narcissist is they're, they're talking like someone doesn't have a mental illness and they're frustrated. Why don't they understand? Mm -hmm. And why don't they take responsibility? And mm -hmm. I do all this for them. And they don't reciprocate. And why don't why do they act like a child? So if you talk to a child like an adult, they're they're not going to uh, follow your your rules. You're going to have to talk to a child at a child's level. And the same thing with a narcissist. You have to understand who you're dealing with, and change your expectations, and know how to communicate with them. And you'll. But in this process that I lay out with, with scripts and strategies and checklists and a lot of uh, homework that you can do, you will become more empowered. And mm. then the dynamic in the relationship changes. And mm. not only that, you'll be able to decide for yourself what the prognosis is, if there's enough change, uh, if there's enough good in the relationship to stay. And if not, you'll have the strength and the courage to leave because P.S. an abusive relationship is harder to leave than a healthy one, surprisingly. Mm. So outsiders will say, just leave that that guy is a jerk or that woman just thinks she's a princess. She's so spoiled. You know, you could do better, but it's not easy to leave because of trauma bonds and learn helplessness and a lot of factors. Um, and the people that contact me, they love their narcissists. 
they want to make it work. So, okay, I want to add. I want to explore that a little bit more. Talk about trauma bonding because I agree with you. You know, and and I didn't do a ton of couples work in my private practice. However, I had a lot of women that when they would report to me what was going on in their marriages, I would say, wow, you know, this sounds a lot like you're in a narcissistic relationship. And I would clearly hear signs of abuse. And you're right. When I would uh, speak about abuse, they would push back, deny, you know, I'm not going anywhere. You know, what is that about? Talk about trauma bonding for those people that don't know what that term means. Well, there are a lot of factors that go into it. And sometimes uh, it starts in childhood. So there's trauma in childhood and whatever is going on with your parent, it feels familiar yeah. in their adult relationships. So you don't realize it. In fact, I mean, I knew that I was married to an alcoholic and I knew, and he would call me names, be verbally abusive. And I knew that this wasn't, you know, something was wrong, but I never heard the word abuse. I never had that terminology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I took an assertiveness training class of all places. And then I came home and I said, you're being abusive. And like his jaw dropped. So wow. just having the label to know that and people contact me and they write all these awful things their partner is doing. And they say, is that abuse? So the, the first thing I want to say to your audience, and I say this every time I'm interviewed, is it's so important. If you suspect you're being abused, you probably are. Yeah. Yeah. And get it because for myself and millions of people out there, and even men more so than women because of their pride, Mm-hmm. in it being abused by a woman and that they're they feel not man enough mm-hmm. they keep it to themselves and that's the worst thing you can do is to isolate because an abuser is controlling and they want to isolate you and they don't want you to talk to your friends your family uh, or a therapist or get outside help they want to keep it secret and that is a symptom of a dysfunctional you know family maybe in your home growing up there were family secrets, like uh, uh, addiction, criminality, abuse, mental illness, things like that. I think that's a key point that I really hope everybody hears right now is that when you're in a dysfunctional relationship, the person that you're with will want to isolate you. So take a look around you. And if you are, if you've lost your friendships, family mm-hmm. relationships, Mm-hmm. take a look around. And if you had them prior to that relationship and now they're not there, there's something going on here mm-hmm. you know? because that person, and this, and this, I know personally and professionally for years, people would say, yeah, I've lost everybody. Well, wait a minute. When did it happen? Well, after I got in this relationship mm-hmm. is that person gaslights and poisons our mind and start, and then we start believing them and then we lose everybody. It's control. It's manipulation. And it's intentional. Um, they don't want you to report to any. They, no. they want to control you because you talk to other people, you get outside influence. Yeah. So, yep. and they will try to intimidate you and say, well, well, whose side are you on? Yes. You're against me. Yeah. Uh, things like that. But that's not what's going on. You should be able to be able to talk to friends and family about what's going on and get, certainly get help. So that's the first thing in terms yeah. of trauma bonds. Uh, well, a couple of things. Your childhood makes you more susceptible, and then the denial. And then uh, even though someone might be abusing you, you become more dependent on them. Mm. Your person, and you're expecting, like the abuser, to protect you. Well, they're not going to protect you. You're going to have to go learn to stand up for yourself or get outside protection. Yeah. And uh, so what happens is that in the beginning of a relationship, all relationships, people are on their best behavior in the beginning. But for an abuser, and especially a narcissist, they're on their best. When I say best behavior, it's it's false. It's not just their best behavior. Mm -hmm. It's an act because they're all about impression management. Because of their inner 
low self-esteem and shame, which I could talk more about later, mm -hmm. they want to make you admire them and love them and like them. Mm -hmm. That's why they boast all the time. That's why they do love bombing. And they want to win you over because then they feel more uh, lovable, likable, powerful. And so they'll act in a certain way to make you fall in love with them. You think, this is like the best relationship. This is the relationship I've dreamed of. I found my prince or my princess. It's just like wonderful. And then after the narcissist feels like, okay, you're committed. You don't have to work so hard. That was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So then they relax and then they go back to their ordinary personality. And pretty soon the idealizing starts, changes to devaluing and fault finding. And then they do so much fault finding that they think I can't even love this person because they have this flaw and that flaw. And, and, and then that continues. And But yet the partner, even years later, is still hoping that that romantic, amiable person is going to come back. And once in a while, the narcissist does, or they see it in public, you know. Yeah, so with other people. Them. They see it with other people because the mask is on and they're like, oh, that's the person I fell in love with. I want yeah. him or her. Yeah. yeah. And so it keeps them, they get crumbs. Yeah. And they'll, so they relentlessly try and it then becomes an addictive process. Yeah. Like playing the slot machine. So once in a while you win, so you stay in there. And then mm. you end up bankrupt at the end, which is what happens. You know, so when we talk about trauma bonds, just define that for us. What does that mean specifically? Well, it's, it comes from a situation where someone is really a captive. So it doesn't, the original definition didn't apply to uh, just ordinary relationships. But if you're a captive, then you start to befriend your captor and you think it's the two of us against the world. So if you're like a, a prisoner or hostage or something like that, where that's kind of where it originally came from. Mm -hmm. And so you feel like, um, and sometimes, you know, the captor uh, will be nice to you. The jailer will be nice to you. So you start building this friendship with them you could start feeling like mm. you don't want um and i i felt this way too when i was married to this alcoholic like uh you know it's us the 12 step programs are they going to like brainwash us or something mm -hmm. so there's this feeling like the two of you are bonded together and and you don't want to break up that bond even though it's based on trauma it's a trauma bond yeah so it becomes harder and so that's, and you know, the, uh, an abuser isn't abusive all the time. Right. And then there's a cycle of abuse too. So sometimes there's, uh, there's a, the trauma and then they could be, uh, narcissist doesn't usually apologize, but other abusers sometimes do. And then there's this honeymoon period and, or they try to make, even a narcissist might try to make it up to you by buying you gifts or doing something nice, you know, to you rather than apologize. Mm -hmm. And then things are good for a little bit. And then you fall in love again and then you're hopeful. And then there may be other good things. Maybe there's a lifestyle you like. You're raising children together. Maybe you're in a business together. Or, you know, there's a lot of money or travel or other perks in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So there's other things that keep you there. Mm. You've used the word abuse many times. Mm -hmm. Tell us, because I think sometimes people, I, I can't tell you the number of people that have sat across from me, whether it be on Zoom or in person, and I've reflected back to them, wow, that sounds like abuse. And they look at me like I have five heads. It is? Yes. <laughs> That's abusive. Yeah. But I think, again, it becomes our norm. You know, this is just how I'm treated. And it's, it's this, it's like a trickle. Like it just, it starts happening little by little, by little, by little, by little, by little. And all of a sudden we're in this and we normalize abuse. So please tell us what abuse, give us some examples of what abusive looks like. Okay. Well, first of all, let me just say there's about at least five different kinds of abuse. Yeah. So 
there's psychological, emotional abuse, mm -hmm. which I would include mental abuse in that category. And that's not just words like calling you names. It might be giving you orders. It might be subtle undermining you. That how includes about, verbal abuse. Yeah, and how about, uh, tra I had many clients, uh, tracking your partner when they leave the house. Like for example, I remember I had a client, she was just going to Target and then mm -hmm. home and she stopped at the bakery on the way home and her, I don't remember if it was her husband or boyfriend, it doesn't matter, but had called her and said, what the hell are you doing? Where are you? And she said, I'm at the bakery, I'm picking up some muffins. And he just berated her and screamed at her because she didn't tell him. Well, that come, well, that's a couple of things. There's yeah. there was physical abuse that he's invading her privacy by tracking her, mm -hmm. hitting you in a corner, uh, invading your privacy. So there's physical abuse, mm -hmm. sexual abuse, which mm -hmm. is pretty obvious, you know, forcing you to have sex when you don't want to. This is one thing or doing sexual acts that you don't want to do. I've had clients that went along with threesomes that they didn't want to or mm. uh, news posts for nude pictures that they didn't want to do, things like that. Uh, and I mentioned physical, which is includes violence, of course, or breaking property. Mm -hmm. And then there's financial abuse. When someone's mm. controlling your finances or mm -hmm. withholding them or hiding uh, assets or things like that, access to funds. And then there's spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. That happens more uh, with children, where a parent like employs God as the punisher, so it distorts your relationship to God and spirituality, that you're a sinner or God's going to punish you. So it takes the word of the parent to a higher level, yeah. and it destroys a child's relationship with God and spirituality. That's just one, one example. But, well, so I've heard that levels and I'm then also, manipulation. Is, is yeah, manipulation. I, I just want to comment on the spiritual abuse. I was speaking with someone a, a few months ago and she said um, that once she was, I can't remember what church, some Christian faith, but said that uh, once she was uh, married, her husband said, um, now you belong to me. So you're going to do what I want, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's like something in the Bible that says this, and she quoted it to me. And basically her body now was the property of her husband's. It was property. She was property. Right. So she was in a narcissistic relationship for many years. And um, he just did to her sexually, whatever he wanted. And mm -hmm. she just said, well, I had to, because I was his property. So that's abusive. Again, I want people that are listening to this, that's abuse. Like this is just another I wanted just to comment on that because I, unfortunately, I did not hear that once. I heard it a few times about a woman's body being property to the man that they marry. So my hunch is that that was in her belief system too. Mm -hmm. So that's a psychological, mental abuse. Yeah. And it must have resonated with something she learned growing up or she would have said, who, who do you think you are? <laughs> right. So that, that wouldn't make any sense to her. Right. I remember when I was in law school, you know, I used to be a lawyer before I was a therapist and I was dating a guy and uh, I think he was a narcissist, but I didn't know that at the time. And he said to me, well, a man is like the sun and a woman is like the moon or a planet revolving around the sun. <gasps> what? <laughs> no. And he wanted me to so. iron your shirts. I said, I don't. I don't know how to, I'm not going to iron your shirts. <laughs> so that was kind of uh, abhorrent to me, but I was in love with him nonetheless. Oh and my gosh. That oh my gosh. Fortunately didn't last, but um, so. You know, yeah, can, can, we, can we, would you say this is true? If it feels off in some way, it yeah. probably is. Like exactly. it's probably slight abuse or a lot of abuse. People that love you, I don't care how angry they are, don't throw you into the wall, don't throw a punch at you, don't track you on their phones, they don't scream at you and call you names. You know, that's not what we do, you know, when we love someone. I, the people that I love, man, I fight with them. That's being human. Sometimes I'm going to get angry with yeah. family or friends and we fight 
-hmm. and then it's over and we apologize and we resolve it and we move on. Mm -hmm. Someone that's abusive, it's more one-sided and it is, you'll know it in your gut. Like this isn't right. He just called oh. me a blankety blank, or she just said this to me that felt really bad. Right. Right. So, well, so people say, and I used to do this too. Well, he doesn't mean it. Yeah. I know he loves me or yes. he had a bad childhood or he'll get over There's it. There's always an excuse, right? So those are those that minimization, rationalization, or it doesn't hurt, you know, um, yeah. those are ways of, those are forms of denial yeah. and ways of coping when you don't have other skills until you learn that you have a rights. This is about being assertive, that you have needs and wants and that you can express them and you have the words and the courage to do so. So when you start standing up to abuse in the right way, uh, the abuser will back off and you have to know what you're doing and you have to do it right and you have to have a support system. Mm. But I want to point out there's much more subtle forms of abuse. Mm. That's obvious. What you're yeah, yeah. Doing. Well, but again, obvious somebody... to us, but someone in it, I'm realizing it's not that obvious. It feels right. normal. So what are subtle? Someone just undermining you or negating you. Well, yeah. You know, they constantly saying, well, that's a stupid idea, or that's not going to work, or why would you think that you could even do that, you know? Oh, like, yes. It's just subtly yeah, undermining you and yeah. interrupting you, talking for you. Um, not paying attention to you even, or well, denying your reality again. Uh, holding. Yeah. Holding. You know what? I think I have a list of abuse right behind me. Yeah, grab it. Let's hear it. It's I... Yeah, I was just that's a really good point. I like that yourself. because I think that again, we don't realize that when we're in a let's say like a social setting, you know, at a dinner party or something, and your partner is ignoring you or not allowing you to speak, or the limelight is moved from your partner to them, let's say, or something like this, right? It's abuse. Yeah, and another thing is like talking negatively about you in front of other people yes so, and not supporting your ideas yeah exactly yeah so here's some here's a list of some uh forms of emotional psychological abuse mm -hmm. we mentioned controlling i'm not going to go into detail or examples withholding mm. stonewall stonewalling is is common now this is something that wait uh, a minute and explain that, please. I, I know what it means, but I really want everyone to, on the call to yeah. hear on the show. To so hear. it's one thing to have an argument and then there's a cooling off period or someone yeah. withdraws for an hour or two, but to not talk to you for more than a day to yeah. then go on. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, some parents, and this is very traumatic to a child, they punish by withholding love. Oh. And that creates a shame bond. Sad. Yeah. Rather than consequences like go to your room or you can't watch TV and things like that. So they just get very cold and they withhold love from the child. That sets up a shame because you feel like uh, you're bad and a child's survival psychologically, physically is dependent on their parent. And mm -hmm. they need to feel loved and accepted by that parent. So that's very destructive. So if a spouse does that, I always say, like, you don't have to go along with it. Just act normal. You know, you could say, do you want a cup of coffee? How was your day? You know, just because when you react to it, that gives it more power. But anyway, so stonewalling is, yeah. is yeah. Abuse. that's an example of withholding. So withholding affection, support, you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, that includes financial. Ignoring, I think you said ignoring you at a party. So you're talking to them and they're rolling their eyes. It doesn't even have to be verbal. Yeah. Yes, that eye yes. roll. That eye roll goes right through your heart, doesn't it? Like it's like, oof. Yeah. It's belittling. So any kind of belittling is abuse. Yeah. Looking the other way. Uh, invasion, prop, privacy invasion. Uh, looking in your phone, mm. your diary, things like that. Eavesdropping. Um, sabotaging you with we, we mentioned that like your endeavors and things like that undermining yeah like had, saying things like i remember i had a client and um she was talking about uh 
bringing a product to market and also going back to get her master's. And her husband said, why would you do that? Like, that is silly. That that's not going to go anywhere. That's a, that's, that's a dumb idea. And why would you go back to school at your age? I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Again, when you're in it and she really believed it. Yeah, you're probably right. It's not a good idea. I was like, no, this is abusive. So thank you. I want to give some examples and context because I think people, I want to make sure everyone listening to this going, oh my gosh, that's abusive. Yes. Oh, here's another example. Yeah. Your partner's on a diet and you offer them desserts. <gasps> oh, that's a good one, Darlene. That's a good one. Yeah. Passive aggressive. Oh. Passive aggressive. So exploitation. That's also a trait of narcissists. Um, so Talk. using you, using people. G give me an example. Yeah, give us uh, an example of that. Well, one might be, you know, using your, at work, they might use your ideas mm. or your uh, work product. And, and take credit for it and not give you credit kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that's awful. So, uh, or ex exploiting you for sex, but they don't really care about you. Mm. Or for money. You know, in a relationship, like a woman might want, just to be wined and dined, but she doesn't. <laughs> I've heard of a guy told me one that uh, once that um, the new thing that some young women are doing, they're going on dates. And then uh, just before the check appears, they say, excuse me, they go to the bathroom and they ditch the ditch the guy. No. Yeah. Oh, that's horrible. So the women exploiting the men. Come on, women. No, 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 no horrible yeah, or even getting married because a guy has money yeah You're taking advantage of that I, i've got I a question of, i'm sorry i don't want to are you done with that list because i have a question about that specific well i was going to go on to forms of verbal abuse so that was oh yeah simple. please go on darlene <laughs> all right yeah so we mentioned shouting raging name calling ordering uh criticism a lot of judging belittling and then there's some other more subtle things opposing you like you gave examples, like they're always, whatever you say, they say the opposite. They're always contrary, yeah. opposing you. Um, and name calling is not just, you know, you're a bitch, but it could be um, chubby Charlie, you know, just giving you a nickname that's derogatory, something like that. Uh, going on tirades. So not necessarily raging, mm -hmm. but just like, trying to hold your attention while they go on like a, a grandstand of, and a tirade about could be something else. Mm. And not to listen to you at all, right? It's like very one-sided kind of thing. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of, they're going on this uh, whole thing, uh, including long belligerent speeches and they expect you to sit there and listen to them while they go on and on uh, blocking you. Uh, in, in conversation or physically blocking you. Mm. And we mentioned discounting, belittling. Not uh, acknowledging, again, I, I feel like that's part of what you're saying. Like if I'm doing all the talking and I'm not acknowledging my partner sitting here and we're in a group, like that hurts. That hurts my partner, right? right. Yeah. Lying. Oh yeah, yes. Lying. No, not all lying is gaslighting. Gaslighting is a is a meticulous, malicious, methodical, you know, plan that someone has to make you, this is a form of manipulation. Is gaslighting you think conscious or, or unconscious? Well, I always thought it was conscious, but actually there's now some literature out that it also can be unconscious because if someone grew up with that, it becomes a learned behavior. Yeah, it's just their norm and they don't even know they're doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, it's like I had a, a narcissistic mother that was very manipulative. So I didn't know that I was being manipulated, mm -hmm. for instance, with guilt. Wow. Yeah, so if you uh, experience something as a child, it'll feel familiar. Yes. Yeah. Like we talk about abuse in general. Yeah. Yep. So another thing is negative contrasting. What's and that? I've had clients whose parents did this. A narcissistic parent was always negatively contrasting them to a neighbor, to a sibling, mm. and then they do it to themselves. And it's so shaming. Give us an example of that. Oh, well, my ex-wife, my former wife, she was so much nicer to me. Mm. You know? 
She would do whatever I said. I had sex with me all the time. I don't know why you don't want to. What's wrong with you? Maybe you're frigid. I heard that too from clients. Like what? <laughs> so uh, there are other ways uh, and it works both ways, men, women to men too. Yeah. I, so, I, you know, unfortunately I also had some men that the women were abusive as well. And they oh, yeah. were, the men were the codependents and the women were narcissistic beyond measure. And um, yeah, so it, it does, it goes both ways for sure. Yeah, I've had a lot of male clients. I had one whose uh, wife expected him to draw his temp her bath at a precise temperature <laughs> and have the car stocked with all of her favorite goodies and water. And she could only go to the best restaurants. And he was, whatever he did, of course, was wrong, was not sufficient. That's the other thing because narcissist demands are relentless and you'll never satisfy them. So. Wow disabuse yourself of the idea that I'm going to get it right one day. That's another mistake that partners make. And then there's all kinds of forms of manipulation, oh, which I mentioned, like, you know, giving you double messages, mm -hmm. putting you in a, a box, like, so you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Um, and we mentioned denial, so they will deny things. And then there's something called DARVO. Have you heard of DARVO? No, what's DARVO? I've never heard of it. Just, just did a blog about it. It's denial and then attack and then reverse victim and offender. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, give us an example. Yeah. So you accuse, you, you at, confront your partner, mm -hmm. but maybe you suspect that he's having an affair. Mm -hmm. So he says, are you kidding? And no, I never did that. But I know that you did. Oh, it turns the table around. So it's like a projection. It, well, is it might a projection. be project projection yeah. or just, you know, but it's reversing and re projecting. Oh, wow. denial and then attack like, <gasps> or how dare you? You know, you looked at my phone. Are you kidding? Are you a, you know, uh, you violated my rights and then goes on the attack. And now, He's all bent out like he's the victim and you're the perpetrator. So deny, attack, and then reverse so that you're the one on the defensive. R. Kelly did this on an interview on TV. Oh, yeah, and yeah. I have a link to it on my blog about Darvo where you can see he gets enraged at the questions and he starts attacking the press and the victims you know, for accusing him. And he stands up and he gets very belligerent, like poor me. So of course, all this, you know, proved to be true. Wow. Uh, yeah, of course, in the end, it is true, right? Right. Fake concern. Mm -hmm. This is part of gaslighting. Mm -hmm. So I'm so concerned about you seem to be losing your memory. And I'm worried about your mental health while they're undermining you or things like that. Um, guilt tripping. Mm. Like. Are you kidding that you did this? Uh, you have no class or just blaming and fault finding. Narcissists and abusers by and large will never take responsibility for anything because of the shame underneath. Oh. So they, there's a saying is like projection is a confession. Oh, that's good. So. That, that, that's, that, that's a very interesting statement, though. They'll never take responsibility. So when you talk about someone that can change, right, can that change? Like, will they reach a point? And again, I know it's individual. I'm trying to put it in a box and make it nice and neat because that's how I like things. <laughs> but here's the question. Well, I think I overstated. I shouldn't say no. Okay. Mostly. I mean, that's usually the pattern. It's particularly in the moment. They may the next day or later, uh, if they don't apologize, they may give you a gift or something. Yeah. So recognize that, that what they did was wrong. Like, can they actually grow some empathy and learn empathy? I mean, as an adult, that's a, to me, empathy is something we learn when we're growing up. But I would guess if you have the desire, I mean, the brain is plastic, so we can learn anything, right? So uh, what's your what's your opinion on that? Well, they learn better behavior. Better behavior. Learn, 
but yeah. you're not talking, I don't hear you talking about emotional or becoming more emotion or more empathetic. They're mm -hmm. learning a new behavior so they can learn, wow, I need to, I need to apologize now. Let me go apologize. But they may not feel that they're sorry. That's right. So okay. if you don't, I mean, think of somebody who has autism or something or, or some yes. other illness. Yeah. You know, and, but if they, if you're getting your needs met, I wouldn't worry too much that they can't feel what you're feeling. And there's levels of empathy too. Not, I mean, there's yeah. some codependents that aren't empathetic. Mm -hmm. um, so I give an example in my book. Let's say you're going to the doctor and you would like your spouse to come along. And the narcissist says, I'm too busy. Just go yourself. You don't need me there. And rather than feeling hurt and unloved, he takes the time to explain why it's important. Mm -hmm. Not only important to how you feel, which might not matter to them, yeah. but how it's important to the relationship that this is a two-way street and I want to know you, you have my back mm -hmm. and you ask such good questions of the doctor. You're really smart. You praise them a little bit. And uh, it would mean a lot to me. And I'd feel closer to you and it'd make me want to be there for you. You know, you, you explain to them why it's important. So then they say, oh, okay, I'll be there. So they're just stuck in that mental state. And for people that are, is that, I'm hearing you say that, that it's harder for them to go emotional into the emotional body. Right. And they did some research with people that are, they call it subclinical narcissism. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they're not full blown, all of the character, five characteristics, mm -hmm. maybe they have four or something, but they lack empathy to some degree or varying degree. They can uh, be taught to like, how would this feel if it happened to you? Mm -hmm. And they can think it through. They, sometimes they have a cognitive emotional intelligence. A lot of narcissists have high cognitive intelligence so they can understand. Mm -hmm. And so if you explain it to them, they could understand like there's a need here that you, you know, that they need to behave differently. And they may not ever get it, but they, but they understand it. Like, right. they, yeah, yeah exactly. mentally, I understand you have a need, so I need to do this or that, mm -hmm. but emotionally they're not feeling it. They're not having empathy for I, okay, this is making more sense to me. Like, it's like, I'm not feeling like I need to do this. I logically know that in the past, this is what I needed to do before. I'm going to do it again. So they're, <laughs> they've learned it. We all do that to some extent. Yeah. Maybe we go, a friend is having some opening or a party or a funeral, and you know, they expect you to go to support them. And maybe you don't feel like it, and maybe you don't care. Yeah. But you go because it supports the friendship. Yeah. So you don't have to think of it like in black and white. I mean, yeah. we, we all do sometimes things that we don't feel like doing because it's the right thing to do or because it supports the relationship. I'm thinking of a lot of my clients that I've had over the years that have said, why, you know, and again, most, it seems like narcissists are more men than women, although there are women out there. That's true. There are more men. Yes. So, yes, I, I know that, but I'm, I'm just thinking so many women that I spoke with in my practice would say, I wish, I just wish he could feel where I am. And I'd say, I, he can't, like he's trying, he cannot, he can, he understands it, but he can't feel it. And they get so frustrated. I'm like, wait a minute. It doesn't mean that he's a bad person. He's trying so hard. He just can't feel where you are. So I'm thinking of people that are listening to this today. It would seem that if they want to stay in that relationship to perhaps let go of the fact that that person will ever have empathy the way that they want them to have empathy because they can learn it, which is still a bonus. Well, the other thing is that it may be if they have such a, important need there it may also be um some loss some deficit in their childhood yeah like some people have such a need to be mirrored or understood mm -hmm. and that's the most important thing yeah and i'm sure you've even had clients that 
feel very yeah. frustrated when you don't understand them precisely. Yes. Exactly what, and other people just say, no, that's not exactly what I was saying and it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, um, yeah, think of it this way. You might have a relationship that's a great, healthy relationship, but the person doesn't under, doesn't get you. Maybe you're very um, into spirituality or psychology or something, and they're very concrete. They're just kind of black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. So that might be frustrating. It's not ideal, but yeah. we're a good partner in other ways. So you could think of it like that. It's just maybe uh, one thing that's not what you really want in the relationship, or you're a hiker and you know, you're boyfriend is a couch potato but the rest of the relationship works maybe he's very empathetic but he's not going to do the things you want to do with him and I, and I have to say I, I give kudos to a lot of the partners that are willing to try they may not get it they may not understand their but they're trying they're really 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 trying so I really want to give some kudos to those people um, and if you have a partner that says nope this isn't me it's all you Big red flag, correct? Yeah, I suggest that people, if you suspect you're in an abusive relationship, start writing down conversations and notice where the conversation switches to blaming you. Mm -hmm. So blaming and shaming yeah. is pretty universal with abusers. And the problem is that codependents have shame of their own mm. and low self-esteem and they're sponges for that. Mm. So they just absorb it and their self-esteem gets lower and lower and yeah. their confidence sinks in these relationships because they came into it feeling uh, like not enough or they may have shame that's even unconscious. For years, I had didn't know that I had shame. Most people don't even know it. And then I had a dream. That, uh, I had a dream that I had to get to know this woman named Shame. <laughs> <laughs> wow um, yeah so uh and i was teaching about self-esteem at the time so I, I didn't realize that that was underneath so a lot of people don't there are other you know i wrote a whole book on shame too so there are a lot of people that um walk around feeling worthless or shame and you can their posture usually reflects that mm -hmm. and then there's other people who feel very confident and successful but then something exposes them and then they just they fall apart. They feel mortified. They can't mm -hmm. deal with any kind of exposure of like that, like a, a narcissist too. Although yeah, these are not only narcissists, but then they can't get over when something exposes some flaw, particularly if it's something that's um, very unique to them that they feel ashamed about, like their virility or their um, their success or their kindness you know codependents idealize like love and being a good person and helping people so if you tell them that they're selfish mm -hmm. you tell them that they're uh, thoughtless or something that might hit a nerve with them and they expose them to feeling shame and, and mortified mm. so. wow wow there's, I have so many tangents I've been writing down. I'm like, we can go over here now and here now we need to, to wrap up and hopefully have you back on yet again for podcast number three with us. But I have a couple more questions if you have the time. Mm -hmm. Do healthy, this is a question that has come in for 25 years. I would love your opinion on this. Do healthy people fall for narcissist, uh, really narcissistic relationships or abusive relationships? How does, you know, I can't tell you how many people make it definitely again. small. Yeah. Like but how did this happen stay? to me? What's wrong with me? Why did I attract this person in? How does it happen? Okay. Well, there's, as I said, in the beginning, there is called impression management. They're trying to seduce you, mm -hmm. not just sexually, but narcissists will even learn to mirror your interests mm -hmm. and they, they can learn to be very attentive and, uh, say, oh, I'm interested in that too, and tell me more about it. And that's all to be part of the emotional seduction. Mm. And so, and then share your interests and go along with you. So mm. you think that this relationship is good. 
Yeah. And I talk in my book about what to look for. Mm -hmm. There usually are red flags. You have to know your blind spots too. But if if I'm a healthy woman, would I fall for a narcissist if I, unless I had some sort of wounding that matched something inside of them or could a very healthy, if I have a very healthy upbringing, don't have a lot of childhood wounding, can even I fall for a narcissist? This is the question I've gotten for so many years. Well, there's levels of health, quote unquote health. Okay. And there's levels of narcissism too. I wanted to say, I don't think a healthy person would stay once the devaluing starts in or the control, uh, things like that. But um, what was I going to say? Oh, for instance, if you meet somebody and they start showering you with gifts right away. So one woman might think, this is remarkable. This is incredible. You know, he's so great. And he starts telling me he loves me. Someone who is a little more mature and healthier, mm-hmm. they, he doesn't even know me. Yeah. Why is he doing this? This is They're weird. Like, yeah. yeah. Like this, this is a over term. The top. Yeah. It's over the top. It's too much. Why are they doing well, yeah. yeah, or I've had clients, he started calling me every day. He was so interested in me and they're swept off their feet. Well, someone else would feel, wait a minute, why is he pushing this so fast? Mm. Because it shows some dependency or uh, desperation on his part, on, on the man's part. So, and then there's always going to be some signs. I, I tell clients, you know, look back, review in light of what you know now. And then they say, first they said, oh, all this was hidden until you know we got engaged or until we got married. And then later they look back and say, well, he did uh, want to, uh, he, he put down his ex. Mm-hmm. So that's a sign. Mm-hmm. They starts blaming and bashing other people, wanting to control you typically, uh, after some time, you'll see a narcissist will want to do the dating and the schedule to revolve around them. Mm-hmm. So what's convenient for them? Are they going to go out of your, their way for you? Probably not too long. Mm. And then you get used to it because, oh, he's taking me to such expensive place or trip or event. And so, but that's what he wants to do too. Um, right. So it's going to revolve around him. If he's rude to a waiter. Or if she is um, constantly uh, picky or, or um, you know, demanding at certain things, you'll see little signs of it. And mm-hmm. maybe interlaced with flattery and charm and things like that. But if you look back, you start to see uh, there were signs all along that maybe you overlooked because we want to um, fall in love yeah with most people and so yeah. even some idealization is normal mm-hmm. but when it clouds the negative behavior and it overtakes your reason then that's a sign of some problem within us maybe some mm-hmm. desperation or loneliness or codependency or we tend to idealize someone else and uh, think they're going to change or we can fix them and all this. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. Like, oh, they're going to yeah. change. As soon as we get married, things will be so much better. Or as soon as we have our first child or as soon as whatever, uh, things will be better. No. It I doesn't... wouldn't include that in the healthy yeah. category, someone who thinks that. Yeah, yeah agree. Um, ha- so to answer my question, though, if somebody can healthy people fall for narcissists? Well, as I said, I think you can maybe in the beginning, but yeah. you have to stay. So I don't think you would. I got it. So then you would, it. you would, you would, you would notice like I'm being bamboozled or I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm, they're out of whack with the way they're courting me. There's something off here. So you wouldn't even, it wouldn't get that far. You're saying mm-hmm. into like even a marriage. How do just this one last question for you? Um, how do narcissists? develop or form what mm-hmm. happens when Good they're question. growing up sure yeah mm-hmm. well more research is being done on narcissism and they're finding that uh, on the average 50 percent of it 
is familial and that means it's inherited. Yeah. And then the other could be environmental. So there's some different theories about parenting. Mm-hmm. So classically, it was always thought if you have a hostile um, mm-hmm. parent, that can definitely lead to narcissism. But there's also other theories that say, well, if you indulge a child too much, there's never any consequences. You know, she thinks that she can get whatever she wants and you know, all her needs met and it's always her way. Uh, and there's never feedback of the, this is very important both for codependence and narcissism. And if you have a narcissistic child to give them feedback of the impact of their behavior. And this is what I advise that partners do because they don't learn that. They don't, and if you have a narcissistic parent, you don't know the impact of your behavior because you're just going to be labeled or it's their way or the highway. Mm. Your feelings aren't going to be mirrored. Um, And so a narcissist doesn't realize, they don't see people as separate from them. Whereas a narcissist, uh, a codependent doesn't see themselves as separate from others. So it's kind of their boundaries are- Oh, interesting. So can you, okay, so- Wait, I want to hear that one more time. Yeah, that's complicated. To get yeah, say, I know. I, I, I'm visual, so I'm visualizing this. So go ahead. Say if you could say that one more time. That was really so, good. A narcissist just imagine he doesn't. He sees people kind of fuzzy. They're like cardboard cutouts. Mm-hmm. And he, whatever he's feeling, that's the reality. Whatever he wants, the people are there to serve his needs. It's mm-hmm. all about him. Mm-hmm. So on the flip side, the mm-hmm. codependent. They're invisible to themselves. I have gotcha. needs. I don't know what my needs are. My wants, I don't even know what I'm feeling. But I'm going to make you happy. Mm. So they both put the narcissist first. That's a big problem to begin with. Got and it. then the narcissist prioritizes power mm. in the relationship. And they will sacrifice the relationship to get it. Because that's how they keep safe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. And then the codependent or the partner prioritizes the relationship. That's how they feel safe. If they feel loved and close mm-hmm. and they'll sacrifice themselves to keep it. So mm-hmm. they keep self-sacrificing and going along to get along. Narcissist doesn't care about getting along. Mm-hmm. They want to get ahead. They mm-hmm. want to be number one. Yeah. So in personality styles, they're um, very difficult. Okay. So, um, they're um, very difficult as a personality style to get along with, just period. Mm. Interesting. So, and, you know, codependents, they want to get along. So mm-hmm. they'll compromise. And you keep compromising away until you disappear. Yeah, until there's nobody there. If you're in a relationship with a narcissist, um, it you don't tell them, hey, I think you're a narcissist. Oh, never. Oh my God, no. They're very <laughs> do that. You don't want to say anything critical. Never, because you'll get eaten alive. No, there. You don't criticize. It's, you know, I have a list of, in my book, I go into how to deal with the, the abuse. And, and yeah, and I think everyone just needs to get your book. <laughs> 10 pages of this, different kinds of abuse. But yeah. you because, say what you want and what you need. You don't criticize. Yeah. In fact, in any relationship, if you criticize behavior, the other person feels shamed and defensive. If you ask for what you want, uh, they're more happy to to try to accommodate you. Yes. Relationship work. Yes. I remember having some clients like, "Why? Well, I, I told I told my partner I think they might be a narcissist or my mother, my sister, my brother, or my wife." I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. Of course mm-hmm. they're going to get angry with you and abusive again. No, 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 no. Not a good idea." I think getting your book would be a great idea (laughs) for sure. (laughs) All the info is definitely in the book. Um, Okay, question for you. So something we do on the show is I'm all about teaching people how to live in their adult chair, which is the the emotionally speaking healthiest version of self. Mm -hmm. What do you do as a practice to help yourself stay there? What Or what is something you have done to continue to work on you know, staying healthy, emotionally healthy. What is some, what is something that you've done? Meditate every day. Oh, good. Number one. Yeah. And spend time with uh, myself and, and, and try to relax and be in nature. That's mm. always, you know, 
Uh, and uh, what I really like is my creativity. That's why I like to write. Oh, I so. love it. I know you can tell you got a lot of books there behind yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's impressive. That. And, yeah, I love that. Well, those that's are beautiful. a couple of things that, and I uh, love to dance. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. I love hearing what people, what do they do? You know, we, we all do something a little different. However, a lot of what you mentioned, I love as well, the meditation and nature for me is medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, just listening to the birds. I, my, it's funny, my husband and I were outside the other day, we we're talking and he had, he had a little speaker and he put music on and I said, can you turn it off? And he goes, you don't want to hear music. I said, I'm listening to music. It's the birds. <laughs> I'd rather hear the birds. <laughs> I, I mean, it's not that I don't like music, but when I'm in nature, that's my music. So thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. Have some I, I'll share with you. I bought some chimes that are so beautiful. Oh, and it just puts me like in another world. And I have this bamboo tree that I love. And I love to like sit out there and listen to the chimes and look at the bamboo tree like blowing oh. the wind. And I feel like I'm in another, you know, country <laughs> how, like how regulating is that for the nervous system I'm, I'm i'm listening to it and i'm like oh i just want to do this as i'm listening i'm like oh my god my whole nervous system is like yes i'm sure that's beautiful yeah. <laughs> the bamboo trees when they sway in the wind oh, yeah love it. it's just like so relaxing and then the chimes oh beautiful they're not these dinky ones they're like really yeah. big chimes and they make beautiful sounds oh that sounds lovely <laughs> i love it Thank you. So tell us, how will people find you? Oh, if you just put my name in Google, I'm sure. Darlene Google, Lancer. We'll put all this in the show notes, of course. So, yeah. and um, new book, many books. We'll put those in the show notes as well. And uh, you and I were talking prior to the show about jumping on and doing a live together and chatting about this I, you know, I really want to open up more about shame, even going into shame and more narcissism talk. So we'll be letting everyone know when we're going to go live, but um, it'll be right around the time that the podcast goes. The interesting out. thing is that shame is the connector. Yeah. Narcissism and codependency. And it's just, I was just thinking the other day, it's interesting. I wrote books about all three subjects. Yeah. They all interrelate and shame is like the glue that holds it all, makes it all Absolutely. Work as a common denominator. So it's kind it's, of fascinating. It is fascinating. And the good news is, thanks to you, that we are able to heal and overcome and live beyond our shame. Mm -hmm. And it's not a lifelong process. Like you give people a lot of hope with your books and everything that's in there. So thank mm -hmm. you. So, yeah, maybe on the live, we can talk a little bit more about the shame because I think so many of us live with it and we don't even know it. We don't yeah, know it. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, I like your example. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> I, you didn't even know you, you were, you were living with shame. So and what was really nice was to see some years later that my behavior, my reactions changed. Yeah. And so, I mean, you don't eradicate shame. Like you don't eradicate anger or sadness. It's yeah. just reduced to a normal emotion in appropriate circumstances. Yeah. And, and you know, then, awareness is key. If we're not aware of it, then it's running our lives unconsciously, like a computer, pro, pro, a, a computer program in the back of our mind. It's like, once we're aware of it, then at least we can go, Oh, wait a minute. There's my shame or there's my loneliness or there's my whatever running the show. So this has been great. Thank you so, so much for being on again. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah. We really appreciate it. And we will absolutely uh, be in touch about doing a live and of course in the future doing another podcast because you're always so fun to have on thank you for all your thank wisdom bye-bye I hope that you all enjoyed that show I know I did it is jam-packed full of information like I promised I hope that again you'll be joining me in sh three short weeks my friends I'll be in Nashville Tennessee for the adult chair workshop that is at theadultchair.com forward slash Nashville would love to have you at the adult chair workshop with me live and in person to transform, to get unstuck, to find your true self, to live in your healthiest, healthiest adult, to gosh, look at triggers, to look at boundaries. Let me tell you, we do a ton. <laughs> so come join us. We'd love to see you in person and meet you in person. Have a beautiful week, my friends. I will see you seated right here next week in the adult chair. Mm -hmm.